here sitting downstairs. Come on, give them a round of applause. I want them to hear you. Come on. Milo. That's right. As the editor-in-chief of the Michigan Review for the 2015 to 2016 academic year, I say on behalf of all of us at the paper, as well as those on campus and around the country that have been moved by our stories these past two years, that we are but obliged to you all for your support. Thank you. The Michigan Review has been a beacon for individualism and traditional values in Ann Arbor since its founding in 1982. We do not pretend to fight the established newspaper on campus, the Michigan Daily. I worked with them for two years. I have tremendous respect for them. However, we also do not have any illusions about the blindly progressive culture that has long been Ann Arbor's trademark. The city is known affectionately as 26 square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> we, as a paper, see an imperative in challenging the intellectual complacency we find around us, constantly urging our peers to seek a higher truth as such, the paper has developed a reputation over the years as the voice of the counterculture. In the 80s, the paper was famously burned on the steps of the Michigan Union. When it took a stand against the enforcement of political correctness being enacted at the time by the administration, the American Civil Liberties Union later took the side of the review. We seek to show that diversity is not, as the cultural Marxist agenda on campuses tells us, about the skin color or other contingent labels. Rather, true diversity in the academy is in ideas. I don't have many more months left at Michigan. In my few years here, I have gotten close to professors and friends who have encouraged me to question every one of my assumptions in religion, politics, evolutionary biology, linguistics, literary theory, colonial, colonial theory, human nature, human rights. We have marvelous professors here to learn things only to unlearn them. I owe the way I think to these few people. And yet this attitude of critical inquiry has been sabotaged self-righteously by the left on campus. It is not that I am necessarily more conservative than liberal. It is that the conservative movement, being the minority on campus, is more aware of the danger of bias. Their views are constantly dismissed outright. Liberals are more celebrated and more encouraged and are more vulnerable to developing a patronizing self-righteousness. Their way is obviously the progressive way, and so I have decided to ally with the underdogs, the conservative movement, movement on what ought to be our most vital cause on campus. I'm a brown man, I'm a Muslim. Milo is, is gay, if you haven't noticed, and so, so it's more about our ideas and less about the movement. So I have decided to ally with the underdogs, the conservative movement, on what ought to be our most vital cause on campus, the reason we are here, and that is the unabashed assailment of our assumptions to come to ever more informed understandings. We host our debate today in this endeavor. We will question what no one else will dare question. The wage gap, the validity of microaggressions, the efficacy of Black Lives Matter, the hysteria over return of kings, and the meaning of diversity. We're gonna hear from two radically different perspectives, and the debate will be moderated by women's studies and political science professor, Lisa Dish. In the course of my own often public and often reckless journey, I have shaken, if I have shaken along with myself only a few people to question more rigorous, rigorously, I have succeeded. On behalf of the Michigan Review and on behalf of the University of Michigan, forgotten country, I'm yours. I'd like to welcome up my executive editor, Hunter Swagger. So as he said, I am Hunter Swagger, the executive editor of the Michigan Review. You may know me as the guy depicted in that god-awful Michigan Daily cartoon from a few weeks ago. The, uh, the one that referred to me as literally every worst part of the internet in real life. 
in literally the least funny comic to ever hit the internet in life. You may also know me from that lighthearted little promotional video we put out a few weeks ago titled, uh, Would You Rather Your Child Had Feminism or Cancer? A video so dangerous that we were banned from advertising it on Facebook by Mark Cucker Zuckerberg. <laughs> but it is exactly this style of outrageous humor that our two guests tonight have become world famous for. And their instinct for absurdity is not just confined to the public sphere, not just confined to Twitter. A week ago, I emailed both Milo and Julie and asked them if they had any special requests for tonight's debate. Mr. Yiannopoulos responded, 50 white doves to be released on my entry into the lecture hall, a bottle of Krug Rosé, a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown ones removed, and 10 Panamanian rent boys. Mrs. Bindle replied, a clean pair of extra large dungarees, a copy of The Well of Loneliness, and a severed penis in a glass jar. <laughs> Unfortunately, not everyone can take a joke. And these two have made enemies through their journeys in the plenty which is why I've been instructed to read the following. While this is not a university sponsored or endorsed program, the university is deeply committed to providing a safe and open forum in which diverse opinions can be expressed and heard. It is the right of members of the university community, speakers, artists, and invited guests to express their views at the university. We will protect the right of individuals to speak for form and the rights of the members of the university community who wish to hear and communicate with an invited guest. Protesters have a right to express their opposition to a speaker in appropriate ways, both within this building and outside the facility. However, protesters must not interfere unduly with the communication between a speaker and the audience. If the hosts of tonight's program or university representatives believe that protesters are interfering unduly with a speaker's freedom of expression, those protesters will be warned. If warnings are not heeded and interference continues, the individuals responsible may be removed from the building. On behalf of the university, I thank you for your attention and appreciate your cooperation. And with that, I'd like to invite Dion Katawa. Hello, and welcome to this evening's debate. My name is Dion Katawa, and I'm the politics editor for the Michigan Review. First, I would like to thank Mr. Yiannopoulos and Ms. Bindell Julie, Milo and Julie for joining us, and to Professor Lisa Dish for moderating. I would also like to thank those who helped to make this debate possible. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute, the Collegiate Network, the University of Michigan Chapter of the Young Americans for Freedom, the University of Michigan Chapter of the Young Americans for Liberty, the Central Student Government, the LSA Student Government, and several other private donors. The University of Michigan is home to the victors, the leaders and best. We are once again demonstrating this long-standing commitment to greatness by triumphing where numerous other American and UK-based institutions have failed. We got Milo and Julie. This tradition of excellence allows for events like this debate, which will shatter to bits the dangerous and silly idea that so-called harmful opinions and speech need to be silenced, censored, and repressed. They are essential to the mission of this university. And so it is my distinct honor to welcome as the moderator Professor Lisa Dish. Lisa Dish is Professor of Political Science with a courtesy appointment in Women's Studies. Uh, she is specialist in contemporary political theory and is the author of two books and numerous scholarly articles. She agreed to moderate the debate in honor of a long tradition at the University of Michigan of, of open political discourse and she hopes that this evening will unfold in the spirit of John Stewart of Daily Show fame and John Stewart Mill, intellectual powerhouse of classical liberalism. <laughs> Please join me again in welcoming Professor Dish.
Before I introduce the speakers, I first want to outline the format of this debate. The terms were agreed upon by both parties. They will each give a brief two-minute opening statement. Professor Dish will then ask questions submitted by anonymous students for approximately one hour, and afterward, we will open up for Q&A from the audience for the remainder of the time. Finally, they will each conclude with a two, minute, two minutes worth of closing remarks. I expect that everyone in the audience will abide by the heckler statement given earlier by Hunter Swagger, as well as be respectful, leaving the debating to Milo and Julie. There will be plenty of it, trust me. The topic of tonight's debate invites us to consider, among other things, whether feminism has a free speech problem. It is difficult to overstate the value of free speech for the flourishing of Western civilization, and we do not need to search for too long to see what countries who repress speech, especially the divisive political variety, look like. They are not free. The right to express oneself freely without the threat of government penalty is perhaps our greatest liberty. It allows us to question now fashionable ideas like the gender wage gap and campus rape culture without fear of onerous reprisal. If nothing else, it promises all of us here an electric evening. Now to the speakers. Julie Bindle is a journalist, writer, broadcaster, and researcher. She has been active in the global campaign to end violence toward women and children since 1979 and has written extensively on rape, domestic violence, sexually motivated murder, prostitution and trafficking, child sexual exploitation, stalking, and the rise of religious fundamentalism and its harm to women and girls. She writes for The Guardian and appears regularly on the BBC and Sky News. She was visiting journalist at Brunel University from 2013 to 2014 and is now visiting researcher at Lincoln University. And if you'll direct your attention to the rear of the ballroom, you can join me in welcoming Julie Freedom here tonight. I make my mark and fight for tomorrow Finally I've got some there Something I can raise my voice for Fight me Tell them who you really want Fight me well, You'll get yours and I'll get mine Proud I'm proud to be Proud to see They say proud Proud to be I'm proud to be They say too You got to tell me Freedom. Milo Yiannopoulos is one of the best known technology and media commentators in Europe. He is associate editor of the London office of Breitbart. Milo has been called a rising star of the right by The Spectator, the pit bull of tech media in a profile by The Observer, digital media's Citizen Kane by Forbes magazine, and was dubbed the ultimate troll by Fusion. He refers to himself on his Twitter account as the most fabulous supervillain on the internet. Once again, please join me in welcoming to Ann Arbor, Milo Yiannopoulos. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, and with the first opening statement coming from Julie Bindle, please join me in welcoming again Julie Bindle and Milo Yiannopoulos. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me in for choosing a photograph of me that makes me look like a bulldog chewing a wasp. <laughs> Very much appreciate that. As you can see, I'm actually quite pretty. <laughs> Clearly not as pretty as Milo, but his is, it's all makeup. As a second wave feminist, I don't wear any makeup on principle, obviously. Um, so... We're here to ask the question, is feminism a threat to free speech? Well, no, not my feminism. There are hundreds and thousands of ways to be feminist, and most of them are wrong. <laughs> but, but my one is right, uh, radical feminism, second wave feminism, and the feminism that actually roots male supremacy, patriarchy, men's violence against women and girls as institutionalized 
um, serious problems, pandemics, in fact. And it's not the feminism. My feminism does not subscribe to the fun feminism, those who capitulate to men because they know that it might help them rise quicker up the ranks to get to the glass ceiling, which, quite frankly, I give no fucks about at all, caring more about the women at the bottom. The kind of fun feminism where they blame feminists like me for naming men's violence as the problem, and the kind of so-called feminism that defends Islamofascists over socialist, feminist activists like Mariam Namazi, who is an Iranian political exile, who went to speak at one of the London universities recently, um, who was screamed at, threatened, and shouted down by the Islamic Society, the chair of which was a man who has come out with the most horrific views on women, on gay people, etc. I'm sure you, you know the kind of thing. The LGBT society and the feminist society at that university, after Mariam Namazi had been screamed at, heckled, um, they tried to no-platform her, of course, then wrote a statement which was disgraceful. Both of them did. Two statements saying, we support the Islamic society over Mariam Namazi. They are obviously major bellends. Do you know what a bellend is here? Okay, <laughs> bellend is the end of a penis. <laughs> and we use it as a slur in my country. And I'm aware that it's obviously Islamophobic and anti-Semitic to speak of a penis that may or may not be circumcised without first um, putting that caveat in. Yeah. Um, okay, so to briefly talk about my own no-platforming history, um, I, um, I was the very first non-fascist to be no-platformed by the utter bellendery of the National Union of Students, <laughs> which really all of their uh, administration are so stupid that if they had any fewer brain cells in their head, you'd have to water them twice a day. <laughs> and what these new identifarians decided these third waivers, these keyboard warriors, the ones who subscribe to identity politics but without the politics, what they decided was that an article I wrote in 2004, which offended some trans people, and I say some, that's very, very important, a small group of trans people, they decided I should never ever be redeemed, that I should never be forgiven, that it should never ever be washed away in a sea of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other articles I have written, of the scores of conferences I have spoken at, all for no fee, on violence against women and girls. All my 35 years of unpaid activism disappeared because I was suddenly a vicious transphobe. Now, forget the fact that the activism that I do and many of my feminist colleagues and others on the left who are real social progressives, actually prevents real violence to real people, like can save lives, they decided that if they just, I don't know, get out of bed, having had a quick wank, not had a wash, <laughs> go along and no platform me, because they're stopping a vicious transphobe who causes violence towards trans women on campus, their job is done. You see, all these privileged little dickheads have to do is sit there, <laughs> click, 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 click. She's vicious, she's violent, she causes the death of trans women. And then they realize that actually, I do have quite a reputation. I get invited to universities all over where I don't get no platformed. I have loads of work. I've got a public profile. So they decided they had to throw Islamophobic into the mix because I, along with many of my Muslim-born feminist sisters and colleagues, say that the veil is the symbol of women's oppression. That's all. I'm Islamophobic. It's taking away the agency. Blah, blah, blah. And then, really scratching around, they decide I'm biphobic. Because I wrote a tongue-in-cheek article saying, what on earth is the point of bisexuality, and what oppression do they ever face? <laughs> I am also polyamorophobic. Because I said, and this is true, Actually, radical feminists really like sex. 
in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, we were all non-monogamous, you now call it polyamorous, um, which means that one man shags loads of women and they all put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we had lots of non-monogamous relationships. Um, we, we were the ones that said, listen, you know, if you've never had an orgasm in your life because sex with your husband is really boring, just be a lesbian, the sex is much better, we know what a clitoris is. So, so I'm biphobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, polyamory phobic. Uh, oh, and I'm homophobic as well. And I have to say, I'm probably reaching my time, Chair, but I'm very proud of this. You know the whole trigger warning shtick? So when articles get sent round about me, it's trigger warning, transphobia, biphobia, Islamophobia, even though I've written about the rape conviction rate in the UK and how we should uh, make sure that more rapists should, uh, are convicted, they now just actually send it out just saying, trigger warning, Julie Bindle. <laughs> I am my own trigger warning. <laughs> and I consider it an absolute honor. And there are now more of me that are, that are no platformed. But to come back to the question that this debate is going to look at, is feminism a threat to free speech? Absolutely not. We, the real feminists, the feminists that consider women as a sex class and men as part of the patriarchy, either a benign part or an active part, we actually consider debate to be crucial. We do not turn on our sisters and support Islamofascists who wish to stone adulterous women to death and throw gay people off the tops of buildings. We consider ourselves part of a proud social movement. So feminism is a friend to free speech. Feminism is a friend to every man in this room because we know that you're born a baby, not a rapist. We're anti-biological determinism. We do not consider men to be bad and women to be inherently good. We consider this a problem to be solved together. Thank you. You can see why I like her, can't you? She is, in fact, one of the very few feminists who I, don't mind, I wouldn't mind sitting next to at dinner. Sort of Christina Hoff Summers and you, that's about it. Um, I have to ask for a correction to my introduction because I was introduced as associate editor of Breitbart, but I've had a promotion since then. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I was invited today to debate uh, a feminist that I admire, um, somebody who has fought for years for women and children's rights, somebody I think is, um, is an intellectual powerhouse and who I was excited to, to speak with. She wasn't available, so um, <laughs> thank you to... <laughs> The old jokes are always the best. I know, I know, I know. I'm just kidding. You know I love you. Um, so, no, in all seriousness, Julie is, is one of the good feminists. And the fun thing about this is that we're having a debate at all. Um, the existence of this debate um, sort of is the answer to the question. Some of you will know that uh, Julie and I were both banned. She was banned first, the bitch. Um, I get very upset about this. I'm so much more offensive than you. I mean, it's literally my job to annoy people. I just, you know, I'm sitting on Twitter all day being as offensive as possible, and you get banned first for a 10-year-old article. This is because, 12. 12. 12 12-year-old article. Well, this is, because, this is because the modern social justice movement, like all cults, hates apostates. Mm -hmm. And, of course, um, Julie, as a feminist who's gone off reservation, well, what actually happened is she stayed the same and feminism changed, which is um, what I'm going to move on to in a moment to explain to you why, um, of course, feminism does pose a risk to free speech. Um, feminism moved on and sort of left, left Julie behind. She's now become one of the bad guys, and she has the, um, uh, the much more fun job of showing up for debates when normal feminists won't. Now, it's perfectly reasonable for Julie to reject the brand of feminism that we're going to be talking a lot about today, and she's right when she calls them bellends. They are. Um, she's right, and we're going to call them all sorts of other names in the next two hours. Um, but unfortunately, Julie, feminism has moved on from you. Um, there are plenty more like me, trust me. Well, I, uh, and not just my age. <laughs> there are younger women who are identifying as radical feminist and calling the third wave fun feminist identitarians total bellends. 
Well, I think the problem has been that um, femini- the, the particular mo- modern brand of feminism, the feminism that has a, a problem with free speech, that doesn't like debates, that banned both of us. The, you know, the title of the debate was, does feminism have a problem with free speech? And they banned both sides of the debate. They don't even want the discussion to be had. It's not even like ban the bad guy, which was her somehow. Um, it, it was ban both of you. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the great organizers here, um, Dion and Hunter and, and others, uh, stepped in and said, you know, well, if, they won't, if they won't have it, we'll have you. Um, look, there's a particular brand of feminism which uh, holds almost total sway in the media and in gender studies and women's studies departments. There are honorable exceptions. Um, but by and, and I don't expect you to comment on any of your colleagues, but a lot of your colleagues are off the wall mental. Um, and in. Me- We're in a situation now where students can go to university, they come out dumber than when they went in. They are infantilized by safe space and trigger warning culture. The idea that interrogating a new idea, coming into contact with uh, a school of thought or a person that doesn't conform to your prejudices is somehow problematic, that it gives rise to trauma. This evening, there is a safe space at Michigan University to protect the safety and emotional well-being of students from this dangerous faggot and a lesbian with the wrong opinions. That is insane. And the worst bit of this is that universities have started to go along with it. They have started to respect students' uh, points of view when the students claim that they have been emotionally traumatized by different opinions. And the trigger warning and safe space culture has started to take root even in the best institutions in the country. Um, my view on this is that anybody who asks for a, a safe space or a trigger warning should be immediately expelled. They have demonstrated... <laughs> They have demonstrated that they are incapable of meeting the requirements of their course. Why are you here? Why are you here if not to discover new ways of looking at the world, to discover thinkers and ideas, history, stuff you never imagined um, that was possible, to broaden your intellectual horizons? If you're not prepared to do that, go home, leave. Don't be here. Now... It's all very well for Julie to say that um, you know, her brand of feminism, and she is right that her brand of feminism is in the majority among ordinary women, um, is not a threat to free speech. Unfortunately, her brand of feminism is out of fashion. And as a gay man, I can tell you all about uh, fashion and everything. Um, but I will, tell you, I will tell you about the fashion and feminism briefly, and we'll get to the good stuff. Um, today's feminists, and they don't include Julie because they don't like Julie very much, They don't include Jermaine Greer because they don't like Jermaine Greer very much. They don't include Christina Hoff Summers because they don't like Christina Hoff Summers very much. All these women are womening wrong. Um, They don't like any of these people. What they like is a weird, distorted view of the world that cares more about your orientation and your gender than what is in your head. They care more about what you are than what you say. Um, That is profoundly wrong. And it gives rise to some statements from feminists, you know, whether, whether it's masculinity so fragile, kill all white men, I bathe in male tears. And you can occasionally hear rhetoric like that from Julie's generation of feminists, but by and large, they've got more of a sense of humor about it, so I don't mind so much. Um, You get the sense with the third wave is that they sort of mean this stuff. And very often, when you hear the rhetoric coming out of, whether it's Vox or Gorka or BuzzFeed or Mike or university departments, or even in some cases, the entertainment industry, we're really left in no doubt that feminism is, as Christina Hoff Summers says, a sort of female chauvinism. And it's a kind of female chauvinism that knows it can get away with anything. It can get away with lying about men. It can get away with calling men names. It can get away with telling lies about the wage gap, lies about campus rape culture. You're going to hear in this debate a lot of stuff, and you know, we're going to disagree on, on a lot. And Julie is not you know, a free speech fundamentalist in the way that I am. But one thing that we are united on, I think, is that this particular modern brand of feminism is, a, is, is cancer. Uh, in the immortal words of Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, <laughs> uh, and and it's, it's a sort of... It, it has metastasized on campuses because it has been left unchecked. It has metastasized because uh, nobody ever sat these kids down and said, no, what you're doing is hateful and bigoted and fundamentally sexist. And the worst offense of all is that you bully and deride and ridicule anyone who dares to ask you for evidence. That's the fundamental, um, that, is, that is probably the most characteristic 
uh, feature of modern feminism. It is why feminism is a colossal threat to free speech everywhere it exists, on campuses uh, and in the media. Uh, and it's why the answer to this debate question is yes. Thanks. Thank you. Well, since you raised it, we'll start with a question about the wage gap. Uh, so currently in the U.S., uh, a woman makes on average 79 cents for every dollar nope. the man makes. Now that's the nope. average. That's nope. the average. It's not even the average. See, si, see. Si. Nope. Uh, the interesting thing is that pay is close to equal right after you graduate from college among college-educated men and women. That gap widens when men and women hit their mid-30s, which is when people start having kids. So how should we think about this wage gap? Should we put it down to personal choices, or does sex discrimination play a role? Let's give it to you, Julie. I mean, I have to say, <laughs> I, find, I find the um, whole discussion about the pay gap so boring. <laughs> not because I don't care. As I say, I care about women at the bottom. I do not care about the glass ceiling. But when you hear Milo argue this point, he'll talk about women working different hours, and he'll talk about the glorious joy of motherhood and how it's the most important thing a woman can do. You've looked me up did on I, YouTube. Did I, wake, did I fucking wake up in the 1950s? <laughs> I, no, we were on the same program and I was in the green room and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Now, of course, I'm not going to use any statistics tonight because everybody can come back and make up their own research, which Milo does on a regular basis. <laughs> But you say, Milo, that there is no credible, no credible economist who has ever taken seriously the issue of a pay gap. And you also say, don't you, that because women are in different jobs, it's not comparing like with like, that women work different hours because they choose different lifestyles, they want to be home with their family. Um, that whole shite. Now, <laughs> the Harvard um, <laughs> labor economist, Claudia Goldin, who is very credible, She's not a lunatic, and she's not particularly enamored with feminism. She found that the pay gap is wider in the same highest playing field, okay? So, for example, female fi finance specialists, judges, and lawyers make between, respectively, 66% and 82% of their male counterparts in those roles, okay? And this is all controlling for age, race, hours, and education. Women are also treated extremely harshly if they ask for a pay rise. So again, all this shtick that it's just not really, you know, in women's kind of makeup because we're all soft bunnies that just want to cuddle puppies all the time. I don't think anybody thinks that about you. And not go. <laughs> I know, I'm someone who kickstarts her own vibrator, trust me. <laughs> if, if I was so unfeminist as to own one, which of course I am not. <laughs> of course, women asking for a pay rise, and some of you in here will have been in work situations where you're aware that your male boss is a little bit favoring of your male colleagues. He might be a bit lecturous. He might just be a bit of an arsehole. Um, and women are punished and are treated very harshly for asking directly, assertively, for a pay rise. So all of these issues have to come into it. And like I say, it's really not my topic. Milo will now probably tell you a load of utter lies. If he cites any <laughs> study at all, write it down, look it up. <laughs> well, it doesn't surprise me. Good. It doesn't surprise me to hear a lesbian skeptical about family values. Since, since after their relationships start, you know, lesbian bed death sets in, you know, there's barely, I mean, it's, it's, look, you have to, what you have to understand about the wage gap is that it doesn't, um, first of all, it doesn't exist. Um, it's based on a misunderstanding between wages and earnings. These are two different words in the dictionary. If you want to look something up, look that up. Um, if you take all of the money that women earn and all of the money that men earn and you do a simple division, yes, you will find that the numbers are different, and that's because women make different life choices. If, however, 
you start to drill down to pay, you discover that if there is a wage gap at all, it is in favor not of men, but of women under the age of 30, at least in America. You also discover um, that when you control for women's different life choices, for instance, women tend not to graduate in engineering, and nobody is holding them back from applying for computer science or engineering or physics or any of those subjects. If you believe that there is a patriarchal conspiracy to keep women out of those subjects, you have to explain why there isn't one in veterinary science and biology where women dominate. You discover that women make different life choices, and sometimes there are uncomfortable and unpopular truths that you have to factor in as an economist to this stuff. Women don't work as hard. Now, that's an unpopular thing to say. But they don't work the same hours as men. They take longer holidays, whether or not they've had babies. And, of course, they have children. And I, you know, as a compassionate person, don't mind building in some things into the tax system and into the way the government works to accommodate that and to reward women for doing, you know, for, for performing the essential function of our species. But that doesn't mean that private sector employers should um, pay them when they're not working. Now, to address the point very specifically, you cannot pay a woman and a man differently for doing the same job. That's against the law, and it doesn't happen. There are some cases in which women don't put in the hours it takes to, to make partner. And when you get to those higher professions, which Julie says she doesn't care about, but she will invoke to, to win an argument, um, when you get to those higher levels of employment, sometimes women just don't want to do the 80-hour weeks that men do. Now, part of that is probably biologically rooted. Julie doesn't like biological arguments, but there is very clear evidence that, uh, very clear, I mean, from the evidence of our bodies, but also uh, brain science, that men and women are, are different in, in quite significant cognitive ways. Um, but there's also evidence that even in the most enlightened and equal societies, women stub stubbornly refuse to make the choices that feminists would like them to. For instance, if you look into emerging economies, you discover that the split between um, w uh, ma men and women in subjects that, are, that lead to very high paying jobs, whether it's physics or uh, computer science or maths, it's pretty equal in many cases because those women don't have much of a choice but to just do it, get on with it and make a living. When you look at um, societies that are famed for their feminist credentials that are the most equal places in the world, Sweden, Norway, the West generally, frankly, you discover that a gap opens up and women stop choosing to do certain subjects when they have the full range of options available to them. And what you discover is something counterintuitive and it's that when women are more free to make decisions, when women have more options available to them, more money and better access to the institutions, to education, to the workplace, and they have great access to the workplace. They have better access to the workplace than many men. 2015 Cornell study, yeah, you can look it up, shows that women have a two-to-one advantage over men going for jobs, academic jobs in the STEM field. Please do look it up. Um, you discover that women just won't make the choices feminists would like them to. And they don't make those choices because, yeah, unlike radical lesbian feminists, some women want a family and children. I'd like to move on to a question about affirmative action, but that does not prevent any of you from bringing our guests back to talking about anything that you've heard. So this one's going to be for you, Milo, um, to begin with. Mm -hmm. So since the passage of Proposition 2 in 2006, which was advocated by Jennifer Gratz and former Michigan Senator Leon Drollet, I don't actually know how to say that, who is present in the audience. I would say Drollet, but we're not in France. <laughs> Um, it sounds Spanish, right? with the bulls. <laughs> no, Drolet. Drolet. <laughs> she liked that one. <laughs> Michigan has prohibited uh, preferred admission based on race. Now, <clears throat> the enrollment, however, of black students has dropped by a third since then to 4.6% of the first year class in 2012, which is down from nearly 7% in 2008. Mm -hmm. Yet black people make up 14% of the state's population, which is a little over their share of the population in the nation as a whole. Can I ask what this has got to do with feminism and free speech? Affirmative action is a related question. So uh, our question is, aren't African Americans in the U.S. at a disadvantage in getting a college education, just like the lower-income white males that you've targeted 
for affirmative action with your scholarship. And we wondered if it's okay to create scholarships for particular groups, what's wrong with using race-based admissions to making progress towards justice and equality? Okay, um, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't see what it has to do with the debate, but I'm perfectly happy to answer it. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't allocate uh, financial uh, funds, and I started a fund, uh, a scholarship fund, for particular disadvantaged groups. But it's something quite different to gerrymander SAT scores, to give people free intelligence points, pretending that they are smarter than they are. Because it doesn't help those people. When they get to college, they get to university, they discover that without those free SAT points, they begin to struggle. And that is why, which wasn't mentioned in your statistics, black attrition rates are so bad too. Because what you'll, t what you'll find actually in those schools where they do away with um, race-based favoritism, that the attrition rates of the minorities who do go, uh, when they do away with it, get much, much better. Now, you're not doing anybody any favors by putting them into a course that they're not equipped to uh, complete or not equipped to succeed in. Now, the race question in America is tragic. It's, it's toxic to talk about. It's very complex. And actually, I think that although white middle-class feminists are probably the most privileged group in the history of our civilization, um, certainly, certainly black people in America are not. And some of you will know that I have a vested interest in, in uh, um, black men being as successful as possible. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I don't get to meet them at the parties I go to. Um, but I think the arguments against affirmative action are compelling, and they are that it serves those students very poorly to pretend that they can complete a course they can't if there is a problem, as there is in America, a very serious problem with early stage education of ethnic minorities, terrible quality schools in black areas, that's where you fix things. You improve the quality of teaching. You don't pretend people can deal with a, a Harvard course they can't. Do you wanna? Well, we're talking about a university course, aren't we? Um, Milo, not many people get to Harvard. Um, I am from a very working class background and left school early and went to a really shit school and pretty much had no education. And when I was in my 20s, I had an opportunity to go on something called an access course, which is for disadvantaged people who, are, who need to um, sidestep the formal ways of getting into university which in my country is something called, you have to do a group of A-levels, uh, you have to get particular marks, you have to sit exams. I didn't do any of that. I left school with nothing. Now, I'm really bright, and I would have been left on the scrap heap had I not had this opportunity to go and do this particular degree. Now, I see this is exactly the same as African-American people who are dropped out of the system my family were just seen as not worthy of going to university. My brothers weren't, I wasn't, because of our background. So we were left to one side, and the privileged kids were nurtured through those A-level exams into universities where they felt terribly comfortable. Now, there's no difference for me with African-American people being actually given scholarships because they are want, they're keen to go to university, they're keen to have higher education, I don't know if Milo actually said that these African-American people who are helped in the way that I was in my 20s are stupid, but it sounded a little bit like that to me. No. I don't think that African-American people who are given a helping hand to get to university are stupid or have a low IQ. I no, think that I, they've I been socially that. disadvantaged. <laughs> now, the, the, the other thing about quotas Every single proper feminist I know hates them. We hate affirmative action. We hate that whole positive discrimination stuff. And I'll tell you why we hate it. Because we've had to do it. And why have we had to subscribe to it? Reluctantly, with a bad taste in our mouths. Because hundreds of years of women, for example, in the workplace, forget education, of women being passed over for promotion or even for hiring by male bosses who want to hire somebody in their own image. 
all of that discrimination, the sexual harassment, the punishment when you take any time out to have a child and then go immediately back and work even harder. We needed to do something to break this patriarchal tyranny of the workplace, of the education system, etc. And I want to see the back of it, but we'll only do that when people in education and women in employment have mentors in their image where they are not discriminated against because the man wants to hire his friend. So that's what I want to say about that. I don't like it, but we had to do it. I've got, um, I've got two points to make on that. Uh, one is, um, thank you for letting me come in. Uh, one of them is a question to Julie. Um, given that now uh, more women go to university than men, more women graduate than men, women get higher grades at every level of education than men, and we're now starting to see studies that show they have an advantage when they graduate going into the workplace, would you agree that the time for affirmative action, if there was one, has in any case now passed? No, well, I mean, I don't accept your statements there, Milo. I have to say they sound somewhat sweeping. Um, about well, there's absolutely no question. These are government statistics. Advantage. There's absolutely no question there are more women at uh, university than men. That's okay. simply not in debate. Then I think that what we want to do is see an end to sexism within education, to sexism within the workplace, to this institutionalized misogyny that women have to face and be quiet about and pretend it's not happening. And then we can say goodbye to affirmative action. I don't think anybody How would you thinks it's acceptable that women have to be given a helping hand just to actually be on a level playing field with men often who are more stupid than they are. <laughs> and who um, are wrong for the there job. There are plenty of stupid men out there. My question is, is a specific one. Um, my second question is this. I, I thought you were going to say no, so I've, I've got a second question, and it's, what would be good enough? More women go to university now. More women graduate. Women get higher grades. If you, st if you think that still reflects a culture of misogyny, what's going to be good enough for you? Perhaps the what reason data, why... What data is going to be good enough for you? Perhaps the reason why women get higher grades is because they work harder, because they know that there's a lot more riding on it, because the workplace is going to be less friendly for them. So you say, what's going to be good enough for me? I want an end to patriarchy. I want an <laughs> end to sexism. <laughs> so oh, I'm well, Good luck with in. that. Without the patriarchy, you'd, no, be pretty, no. you'd be pretty screwed. I want to jump in with... Patriarchy, of course, if it exists, paying way more into the system than women do. Women take way more out of the system because they get sick more, they, li they uh, live longer, they have babies. I'm ha perfectly happy to subsidize your, well, not your pregnancy, but um, <laughs> perfectly happy to subsidize other people's pregnancy, but that is the gift of the patriarchy. The internet on which feminists were, you know, uh, operate, an invention of men. Men got us to the moon, men get us to the, you know, all of these things, all of the things from which women, women now benefit all products of the patriarchy. I think you're and right. It, it was, after all, Al Gore who invented the internet, right? Exactly, yes. exactly. Biggest so, patriarch going. And, let me, and, let me just... And, fine, and, you know, I mean, you talk about the patriarchy, what, what, what very often is not spoken about when... This is sort of gets waved through by feminists as though it's a sort of... Um, as it, so it's a given. It's not a given. There are respects in which men have pushed forward civilization in ways that women haven't. But there is also, um, just, just as there is, and I agree with you that there is, an ugly underclass of women who suffer, there is an, undi an ugly underclass class of men who suffer. They are the men who build the roads, the men who are steeplejacks, the men who drive oil trucks, the men who uh, collect refuse from outside your house. Women don't want to do those jobs. They have nothing to say about the gender imbalance in those jobs. And if there is a patriarchy, it isn't doing a very good job of protecting men from the worst jobs in the world. And well, that you is know, why you set up the system, 97, you the That is why... And that is one of the reasons, that is one of the reasons that 97% of workplace fatalities are male. It is one of the reasons why I find it very difficult to swallow this patriarchy nonsense when all of the worst jobs in the world are done by men. That's actually, I did want to ask, what do we mean by the patriarchy today? Well, it's clearly a word that I'm very fond of. Um, like Belen. It's, it's a system. <laughs> It's a system in which women as a sex class um, are oppressed by men as a sex class. And the reason why I use sex class is to make it absolutely clear that this is not talking about the individual, individual relationships, because that's what feminism has become. 
all about the so-called rights and choices of the individual. So pole dance your way to liberation. Hey, you're criticising the I sex did. industry? You're whorephobic. The sex industry is great. We choose it. It's agency. This is what feminism gave me. No, it isn't. It's a collective movement to liberate women from the male sex class and the disproportionate power it has. When male babies are born, they are born privileged everywhere in the world, and then there are different ways that it's played out. So when a male baby is born, it's instantly more privileged. Okay? It's very difficult so to believe that, is what I mean it? by you, patriarchy. When you think that, what is it, one in seven American boys is whacked on Adderall or Ritalin because it's, he's held up to female behavior standards in schools, when you consider um, you know, the structural imbalance. I mean, I'm not a men's rights activist. I don't want to start getting on the kind of... But you're you know, quoting all of their... Well, Nonsense. because they're right. God because they're sticks. right about it. The reason... You know, I don't particularly like some of the rhetoric that comes out of the men's rights movement, but they do have a point when they say women, women have been telling us for 30 years to treat them just like they treat men. Well, taunting is how men bond. And if some of the rhetoric from the men's rights movement is unpleasant, it's because they're just saying, all right, if you want us to treat, us to treat you like we treat our mates, we will. Um, and the talking points that come out of the men's rights movement, I'm sorry to say, are largely correct and, you know, more important than that, rather than the sort of weird, abstract social science uh, world of patriarchy and male oppression, they're rooted in data. They're rooted in fact. They're rooted in the facts that, you know, boys are thrown on these drugs, that exams have been changed in, all over the West Shall to suit how women learn better, and the facts, that, and, and the um, university admissions and graduation criteria I mentioned earlier. If you are going to try to claim that there is still in the West, now if you were talking about the Middle East, we would have no disagreement whatsoever. If you want to try to claim that in the West, in America today, that women are some kind of oppressed class, you're living on another planet. Shall we talk you're about describing the, a world uh, 30 years activists. out of date. <laughs> Should we talk about some of the men's rights activists' data that they put out? Okay, so something that's been really persuasive in the UK and elsewhere, and this has been a total men's rights project has been to say that men suffer domestic violence as much, if not more, at the hands of women than women do at the hands of men. All right? Let's unpick that, shall we? It so that, that, that sounds ridiculous to me. Well, it's um, been I don't, very I don't, I don't know the persuasive. Numbers on that. That's, that sounds ridiculous right, to me, well, so let's I'm not going to defend that position. Let's have a look. You don't, you don't need to, but I want to let you know about Milo's chummy bodies that he's cozying <laughs> up with. Okay? Is this what the left does, you see? They try to associate you with, you with the worst people so, you can imagine. But I'm sitting here with you. So, I mean, my career is over. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think at this point we're both pariahs. It's the, I mean, she's the only person that will debate me. I'm the only person that will debate her. No one else will have us. No one else anyway, will have us. Domestic violence <laughs> is perpetrated by women on men as much, if not more, than women face it. Right. There have been nine to date refuges for battered men that have opened in various parts of the UK. Never has a bed been slept in. They all closed down. Now, when you ask these men's rights activists if domestic violence from women to men in the relationship is so bad, why don't they escape to the refuges? Do you know what they say? Because it's much harder for men, the stigma, the stigma, the stigma. Try being a woman with children that you're responsible for, having to flee the house in the middle of the night. It's not nice for anyone to go to a refuge. Okay, so we knock that one down. Then they say... But look, the British Crime Survey says men have ticked, yes, I'm, I've suffered domestic violence. When you look at the categories, do you know what they said? Special snowflakes. <laughs> they said that they were being nagged. It was verbal abuse. It's very much like the sexual assault right? on campus surveys, isn't it? So yeah, when me... you actually... <laughs> so when you look at this, when you look at the lies that are peddled as fact and truth, you also have to look at the morgues, the mortuaries. Because, of course, men don't die as a result of domestic violence. Maybe one a year where she has perpetrated domestic violence on him and she has throughout their relationship. If that, maybe one a year, if that. Two women every week in England and Wales die 
as a result of domestic violence from men. And half of them die after they've left their husband or they threaten to leave their male partner. Okay, so where are the dead bodies of the men in the morgues if this is such a problem for them? So this is the type of rubbish that you will hear all the time. And I'm absolutely in no doubt that it will be the same guff about how rape never happens on campus. We'd yeah, like I, to I actually pose a question about that. I would like, can I just come back very briefly? Mm, I want to, because it's actually getting late, and we want to ask you a sure. question that will let you talk no about problem. this. No so um, you, Milo, have compared rape culture to Harry Potter. Both fantasy. Yes. <laughs> now, as Julie notes, you do have evidence to back up your claims. She there doesn't is a, like it. She claims that it's fake. Um, she asked you to look it up. It's I not hope fake. You do look it, it up. It's not fake. I've looked it up. It's a 2014 study by the Department of Justice. Um, but yeah, that study, ladies. you know it, <laughs> that study based its statistics on acts of sexual assault that were reported to the police. Yes. Now, a 2015 campus climate study by the University of Michigan found that uh, although 11.4% of the students who were surveyed, and that included men and women, said that they had been kissed, groped, or penetrated without their permission, only 3.9% of those report those experiences to an authority. So that's an interesting and significant disparity. It seems like we have a situation where unwanted contact happens, where people know that it goes on, and people know that few people would be likely to report it as a crime. What's wrong with calling this a culture of sexual assault? Isn't that what a culture is, a set of norms and expectations that you don't have to speak about? Sure. Well, a couple of things to say on that. Um, the first is that rape rates have been going down for 30 years in the West everywhere. Um, and the second, no. it, the second is that, um, the, the, see, the left has a problem with uh, all kinds of bigotry and sexual violence, racial violence. They have a supply and demand problem. There are a lot of feminists, and there aren't enough rapes to go around. There are a lot of race hustlers, I thought you argued and there isn't, there enough, and there isn't enough racism to go around. There are a lot of gay rights activists. There isn't enough homophobia to go around. So what they have to do is um, they have a couple of strategies. Either you look harder. So in the case of homophobia, you've got scores of journalists calling every pizzeria in the Midwest, desperate to find somebody who says, no, I'd rather not do a lesbian wedding. Um, yeah, there, guys, we've got one, we've got one, we've got bigots at last. Um, you know, and then the whole left will all write about this one case. I'm not so there's a supply and demand problem. The other way to do it, no, you're not. The other way to do it is to widen the definition of the thing you're looking for. Now, you said a moment ago that unwanted sexual conduct, conduct which included kissing, um, only, uh, what was it, 3.9%. You said people will be uh, not really willing to report that. Not willing to report an unwanted kiss? Well, thank God the police would never have anything else to do. <laughs> when you widen the definition of sexual assault and you use that widened definition, which encompasses ordinary human sexuality, the confusion and fumbling and exploration that is part of... of growing into your sexual identity at university, and you call all of that sexual assault, which most of the conduct, uh, conduct guides and um, behavior standards guides at universities these days do that. They do. They criminalize ordinary human sexual behavior. In, in, and then they, uh, you know, by, by broadening the, the definition. When you do that, and then you use it to suggest that it is indicative of some kind of pervasive rape culture, you're making two mistakes. One is you are including things like unwanted kisses. Well, I'm sorry, but I mean, you better lock me up now. Um, <laughs> two, you are suggesting that rape exists on a spectrum. You are suggesting that a culture of uh, sexual frisson, who knows, unwanted kissing, how awful. Um, you know, you are suggesting that that somehow exists on a spectrum, the ultimate end point of which is rape. That's insane. That's not how rape works. No crime happens like that. Uh, it's just not how it works. Rape is a very specific, and, and you know, Julie knows a lot about this. Very, rape, you know, it's a, it's a horrific and specific crime, but it doesn't start with touching the, uh, the elbow. And so when you ask the question, does, is there a rape culture on campus, my only, my only response can be these 
campuses where women have been told for 30, 40 years, provided with every possible support network, more and more opening up all the time, encouraged to report the slightest infraction and to call it a microaggression. They have every service available to them now, and yet the rates of, these, the rates of real rapes are still going down according to the Department of Justice statistics. The only thing that's really going up is this broadened definition which is ultimately meaningless, which has criminalized, to use the word loosely, ordinary human sexual interaction. That's wrong. It does not reflect the way that human sexuality evolves, and it does a huge disservice to women, because it tells all women that they are victims of sexual violence just because somebody tried to kiss them or touch their boobs. Who cares? Earlier generations, earlier generations of women would have said, get your fucking hands off me. Today's women, file a sexual assault claim. Where there is... Where there are instances... Wait, 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 wait. Julie gets to come in. Yeah. Does there anybody in this room know of a woman who has taken uh, a case to trial <clears throat> of an unwanted kiss? Does anyone in this room know of a man who's been convicted of a sexual assault for an unwanted kiss? No, you're suggesting this stuff goes to trial. What I'm saying No, I'm, is, just, I'm just wondering. What I, no, what I'm okay, saying... I'm just wondering. No, it doesn't get to criminal trial, partly because universities have been encouraged to sort this stuff out themselves. Okay, let me tell you some... Let me give you some facts here that... I think most, if not all, of the women in the room, and some of the men will know... The one thing that unites women everywhere in the world, there's only one thing, because we're, of course, different class backgrounds, different levels of education, uh, different cultures, etc. But the one thing that unites us is the fear and reality of sexual violence. Now, we don't walk around needing smelling salts. We don't walk around, the majority of us, traumatized at the idea that if we go home drunk in a cab that we'll be raped. But we do think about it, and we are brought, brought up telling, being told that it's our responsibility. And if we are raped, we are told it's our fault. Alcohol is the new short skirt. If we've had anything to drink at all, we think that we don't report it. We think that if we do, that we'll be laughed at, derided, called a slag, a slut. Incidentally, before I came into this uh, debate, I asked our colleagues, um, about the slurs, because we use bell end and wanker and things. Um, and, and what they told me was that the terms of insult that it, quite common, correct me if I'm wrong, is fag, bitch, pussy, cunt, gringe, cocksucker, motherfucker. <clears throat> now, what do all of those have in common? They're all totally misogynistic slurs. You call somebody a pussy, that means you're female. It's a disgusting body part. You call somebody a cunt, what does that mean? I wear cocksucker with pride, I don't know about you. You call somebody <laughs> Well, I do know about you. It's misogyny. But anyway, let's get back to the rape thing. <laughs> so I have sat in lots of rape trials. Lots of rape trials, okay? I've heard, I've seen the prosecutors fall asleep. I've heard the defense barristers joke about the underwear that the complainant was wearing. I've heard judges say that a three-year-old, in one case, was sexually promiscuous, okay? I've heard judges blame children and women for being sexually alluring when they were asleep, when some man raped them, right? So I don't think that it's that common in fact, I know it is not. That women will decide, for a laugh, I'm going to actually report somebody for rape. Let me tell you about one rare conviction in the UK. Because actually one statistic I will give you, because it's watertight, is that 94% of all rapes that are reported in the UK, right, 94% do not end in a conviction. So are all of those 94% of women lying, you decide. Okay, so one conviction is of quite a famous footballer called Ched Evans. 
And he was actually convicted of raping a girl. That girl has had to change her identity five times because his supporters blamed her for ruining his career. So even when they are convicted on the rare occasions, it's still not rape, rape. It's still not really rape. Okay? One of the first campaigns I got involved in was to criminalize rape within marriage. It is still legal to rape your wife in several countries around the world. We only passed that law in 1992, and this is in the UK. Okay? So whatever's going on on campus, I think, is at least part a reaction to the fact that women have been disbelieved, have been blamed, have been denied justice, that there are men walking around who have raped several women. There are cases that have been studied by eminent academics where men have been acquitted six, seven, eight, nine times before they were finally convicted and the jury couldn't know about their previous convictions when they were deliberating on the 10th rape, okay? So make your mind up. I think... Um... Julie's been doing this for a long time and has some very harrowing stories, and it's certainly a horrible crime um, and one that should be punished very harshly. My suggestion to her, though, is that on campuses, at least, the pendulum has swung a little too far in the other direction, that the definition of sexual assault has been widened. And also, and this is um, very Orwellian and very worrying, and it should worry everybody in this hall, really, that the judicial system, which is... Uh, has in many cases failed women, is becoming replaced by university kangaroo courts. It's becoming repa replaced by courts made up of university administrators who determine on sexual assault charges with the lowest possible bar of evidence called preponderance of the evidence, right? 51% likely he probably did it, right? And that's enough to ruin a man's reputation. Now, there are false rape claims. The, one of the problems is the left-wing media. One of the problems is that they are so desperate in as I said earlier, to find these juicy examples and then spread them far and wide, however implausible they may sound, however unfair they are, that, of course, many of the high-profile ones end up turning out to be nonsense. And indeed, all of the most prominent campus rapes from the last 10 years have turned out to be nonsense, all of them. Whether it's Duke Lacrosse or Emma Solkowitz at Columbia or the UVA case. Now, this does a disservice to women because it means that women aren't believed. And women think, well, if I go and report that something has happened to me, something serious, not an unwanted kiss, but something serious, I might not be believed because these lying bitches have tried to besmirch the reputation of men and been believed by the press, turned into celebrities, and then it turns out they're fantasists. I want to protect women from that, and I don't want uh, a liberal media that just believes, uh, that listens and believes, which is a great feminist mantra today, listen and believe. If a woman tells you something, just listen, but just take it. Just take it as gospel. No, I don't. Well, that doesn't I don't take rape, it as that's for sure. Now, one last thing. You know, you, Julie mentions you know, that we don't walk around like special snowflakes, terrified when we go home on the bus. Well, many young girls are being taught to do precisely that. Now, on the one hand, perhaps they should, because the reality of male sexuality is that it is, or at least it can be at some times, dangerous. Now, that's part of what makes it exciting, certainly what I like about it. But it also means that there is a dark side to male sexuality. And the problem with enlarging the definitions of sexual assault, with telling women that, you know, you can wear anything. You can wear anything you want. You go, girl. You do a slut walk in, in, you know, in your knickers. No man has the right to look at you. Well, the problem is that the people that you meet at 3 a.m. when you're drunk walking home from the club did not go to a consent class at Brown or Brandeis <laughs> or the University of Michigan. These are not the people who are going to rape you. These nice, white, middle-class boys who are so petrified of even approaching girls these days, they don't know what the hell to do. They're, told, they're put in these consent classes where they're told, you're all potential rapists. This is rape culture. Really? I had no idea. I had no idea I was a rapist. Thanks for telling me. What happens, what happens to women who are not adequately prepared for the real world because they have been told that somebody touching their boob is a hideous crime for which they must be punished. It's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Oh, God, sister, sister. What happens when these women get into the real world is they, they are at danger. They are in danger of having something really bad happen to them. And that's why I object to the lie that is campus rape culture. 
Julie. Well, that's a very depressing indictment of male sexuality from Milo. No, I don't find it that at all. Uh, I, I think, think no, uh, no, maybe, no, maybe you find it exciting, but I think that rape and sexual assault for women and girls isn't like, uh, you know, a gay man wanting a little bit of uh, free son in the public toilets, Milo. So... <laughs> Well, as we've, as we've discussed before, it's not fun unless there's the risk of an authority figure wandering in. Anyway. You know? Whether it's, whether it's parents when you're a teenager or the police later, I mean, I can't get it up these days unless I, there's at least a chance I'll get caught. OK. So, all, all very interesting. Julie. But I, I just want to uh, tell you a tiny little story about a sex buyer that I was interviewing for a research project, looking at men who buy sex, who they buy, and what they know. And it was looking at the culture of the sex trade and about men's sense of entitlement. Now, I said to you earlier, I am your friend, men, in this room, because I do not believe you are born bad, and I do not believe you are programmed to rape, and I do not believe there's anything inherently bad or dark about male sexuality. It's about power and a sense of entitlement. That's what you have learned, those of you that choose to sexually dominate women where there's a lack of consent. Now, this sex buyer said to me when I asked him, why do you pay for sex? All of the men I interviewed could easily get a real date, okay? I mean, <laughs> heterosexual women have very low standards, I'm sorry. But <laughs> you, you do, a lot of you, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's probably lost me at least three friends. In There's the nothing wrong with low standards. Anyway. <laughs> so he said to me, this sex buyer, he said, I have to go and pay for sex because I want loads of sex. And if I didn't, if I couldn't get my rocks off, if I couldn't get sex when I wanted it and how I wanted it, I'd have to go out and rape a real woman. So first of all, he was actually very clearly implying that women in prostitution who he was using were not real women. They were just vessels for him to masturbate into, that was clear. But what he was telling me was something that I and my feminist contemporaries have been accused of for decades, which is that we say all men are potential rapists. He was clearly saying all men are potential rapists because he was saying he couldn't control his own sexuality. Now, why have you bought this view of yourselves, those of you that think that, those of you that think it's fine for a man to grab a woman, squeeze her nipple and shove his filthy tongue down her throat and for her to feel fine about it because she's not a special snowflake. In what way is that all right? You're addressing people in the hall like anyone thinks that. You said, you know, in what way, why, who, which among you have, have, you know, taken on this point of view of, of uh, you know, of, of we're all potential rapists. I don't think anybody here has. You obviously spoke to a disturbed individual. That's not reflective of all men. No, it's not. It's and not this, reflective of all men. This and, is exactly and my this, point. And the fact that the this fact is exactly and my the point, fact Milo. and the fact that he's not representative of all men is why some of us prefer data to anecdote. This is and it's exactly a nice story, but I it is making. meaningless. Then, then you have misrepresented me. This is exactly the story that I was telling. For the reason I told it was that if men believe the lies peddled about them, which is that, well, you have to have sex or you're gonna be out of control and, well, of course it's fine to buy women who don't really want your body on top of them, but you're giving them money. I don't In other words, not consenting. Says these things. But, but this is what you were suggesting, that there's this dark side, no, that I'm if women wear a pair of knickers and they go out in a bar, they can expect that men will not be able to control themselves, that it's somehow our responsibility of course men can choose not to assault women if they're standing naked at a bar. I don't think on it's, a a woman, it's not a woman's responsibility to you know, not get raped. But there is obviously, obviously, a set of consequences that go associated with going out, dressed in a provocative manner, drunk, unable to, uh, to be aware of the dangers around you in certain bits of town at certain times of day. I'm not saying, and I ne have never said, and nobody I think would reasonable person would believe that a woman is responsible for not getting raped, but women should be educated about which situations are dangerous for them. And I know you don't like biological determinism, which is why you think this sort of bad male behavior has been socialized in, but it isn't just socialization. I don't think it's a bad thing that there is a dark side to male sexuality. Um, there is, 
yes, there is a dark side, but there's also a light side. And it's the side, or it's the competitive instinct in men that has meant that we invent everything. And <laughs> that we, you know, build the pyramids and have been to space and built the internet and that men did pretty much all the cool stuff that's around you. <laughs> it's the reason, it's the reason in part why that competitive instinct, that testosterone-fueled uh, male instinct, in part, why men work harder and some of them get paid more. I'm going to ask one more question sure, because I want on. you all to have a chance. And I'm going to ask it of Julie. So, Julie, I wondered if this would be a good moment to ask you to clarify what you had in mind when you said that <laughs> men should be put in camps. <laughs> Well, this is a classic example of, and they say feminists don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> so there I was, um, speaking on the phone to a conference organizer who said to me, look, we need to put some kind of interview up um, on the website to advertise the fact that you're speaking. And she asked me a few things about, you know, what do I think the problem is with men and violence and the like. And I said, look, you know, if men don't start behaving themselves, stop beating women up, stop raping and sexually assaulting, if we can't see an end to those men that insist on sending their daughters to be married age 15, if we can't see an end to the terrible harms that come um, because of patriarchy, then I think what we should do is set up a camp for them. <laughs> And I had in my mind some kind of benign holiday camp, <laughs> but with a fence around, <laughs> so enclosed. And I said very clearly, because I'm a kind feminist, <laughs> that they could have things like quad bikes and white vans. Archery on Wednesday afternoons. You know? Yeah, and the lefties could have bicycles, you know. Um, and Because they'd all be in there. I mean, you couldn't just pick the bad men out because men lie about that they're nice and things. Anyway, there's always a crime you've committed, even if it's a thought crime, isn't there? So put them all in and give them lots of things to do. They can play contact sports. They can't have porn, obviously. They can't have the internet, for obvious reason. But they can have television, although it will all be feminist television that they'll be viewing. <laughs> And I said, the thing is that lots of women love men. I mean, there are men I love. But some women actually like having sex with men. And I had this in mind, because I'm a kind feminist, <laughs> that these women could go in and take their sons out for the day, or the women could take their boyfriends out for a good shagging, um, and sisters could go and talk to their brothers. And, you know, but they could then take them back like a library book. So they'd have to be returned by a particular time. And that until they manage to sort themselves out... Oh, and feminists would be in there cooking vegan food. No. Right? Oh. I was with you until then. It sounded like a gay paradise until the vegan food. I know. I know. No booze. No booze, obviously. Oh. So, you know, I, I can see now... And that you it, say that it wasn't, fun. You know, I can see that it wasn't going to be great. But until they sorted themselves out... Anyway, within minutes of this going up, all the men's rights groups, all of my enemies, anyone with access to YouTube, anyone with his spermy little hands, you know, deciding to do his own little, you know, selfie video. That's misandry for anyone paying attention. Had... Had YouTube films up about how Julie Bindle wants to put all men in a Nazi concentration camp. Now... You know, my, my partner's family, some of them are Holocaust survivors. I've heard their stories. I know quite a lot about anti-Semitism and the like. And I figured that I didn't realise that in Auschwitz and Dachau that they had quad bikes and that they could be taken out for the day and be cooked healthy vegetarian and vegan food. So I figured that they'd exaggerated very slightly. And then, of course, I remembered that I'm always compared to Hitler. It's never some mid-range dictator, <laughs> you know. It's never one of those that get forgotten. I mean, Pol Pot never gets a word in. You know, Mugabe, it's always Hitler. And so there was a great kind of women symbol within a swastika. And Julie Bindle wants to put men in Nazi you're identified, camps. You've identified a class you want to put in camps. It's a wonder people can compare you to Hitler. You know, the point, the point is that, as I say, you know, I, I, I agree that the veganism 
is a human rights violation. <laughs> but aside from that... <laughs> So we would like to invite questions from well, Can the I respond floor. to that? Oh, OK. Um, just to defend Julie. Yes. I'd like to defend her. First of all, like I said, get rid, get, rid of the vegan, get rid of the vegan shit, and I am in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Um, what bike or white van? Yeah, no, well, mm. um, I, think if there's, I think if there's a sex that deserves to be put in camps, I think women would be happier on their own. Um, but uh, I want to defend you, and, for the, and the, you said the word humorless. Um, if I'd said something like that, people would have laughed it off. Um, the fact that Julie said it and got a lot of nonsense, I think, shows how um, the modern feminist movement, and, and some, in some cases the modern men's rights movement, when they are at their worst, um, the best ones are great, but some of them, you know, just like feminists, you know, can, can, be, can be awful, do, uh, do indulge in this incredible, deliberate, disingenuous humorlessness. Now, the, when Julie told that story, I think pretty much everybody in here laughed because there was something in there to find that was humorous, but she was also sort of trying to tell her truth or a truth through humor. So just so she's not the only person who has been horrendously uh, bigoted via comedy, I'll tell you my idea. Um, <laughs> And my idea, well, it's not really my idea, because Ann Coulter said this. My idea is that we should remove the vote from women. And I'll tell you why. Women vote terribly. They vote really badly. They don't even vote in their own best interests. The parties in Europe that are welcoming in the Islam Islamo-fascists you hate so much, the parties um, who are welcoming in genuine patriarchies, cultures that do create mass rapes of the kind that have not been seen in Europe since the 1400s, these are left-wing parties overwhelmingly voted into government by women. Those left-wing parties, when they're in power, when they leave, they always seem to report that things are worse for women than when they started. Well, maybe it's time for conservatives to have a go. My now, there's women... one problem with your idea, if I may. Yeah, sure. My men won't have the vote. <laughs> they'll be in the camps. I see. Oh, you've so... been one step ahead of me. We're going to be an autocracy. Women, We're going to be a dictatorship. Um, women always vote for big government, except they don't want to pay for it because it's men who pay more in taxation. They always vote for more services, but they never want to pay. I thought in. men didn't earn more than women. How are they paying? Well, they pay tax? more in, in tax. They always want to uh, indulge themselves on the public teat. Women overwhelmingly work in the public sector, whereas men don't. Men overwhelmingly work for themselves. Women are much more likely statistically to work for somebody else. They don't want to put in, but they like to take out. Uh, so they vote for terrible policies, and they vote for governments that promise them the world. They vote for progressive governments who just want to do cash giveaways. They vote terribly, and they don't even vote in their own interests. They vote uh, for parties that believe in bringing in 1.2 million Syrian refugees who immediately start rape sprees. So for the sake of women, I would like to reverse suffrage. Um, <laughs> To, to protect women from their own bad choices, I would like to remove the... There we go. Now we've both done it. So. Are there questions? <laughs> and the camp was all right. Are there questions? There's only one kind of camp that's okay. On the floor. This we, one. We do have a question. Is there a microphone there? Great. Great. Nope. <laughs> I think that was it. Just Hello? Nope. <laughs> Take this one. Take this one. Here. There we are. We will do 10 minutes of question and answer. Oh, come on now. We can do more than that. How many do you want? Well, until we get tired. She'll get tired before I do. <laughs> no, I'll Sorry. just be deaf and drink. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, just, we'll, we'll get you the wine to the table. You'll be fine. They're such alcoholics. Mark, right. my, my question is more of like a cultural phenomenon I've noticed on the internet. Um, and that's between the atheist movements and the atheist plus movements. Uh, and I want to know both your opinions on that. Uh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> uh, atheism in any case is, um, is sad. Um, <laughs> I, feel, I feel sorry for them. Um, I mean, atheists are sort of like feminists. They're the most thin-skinned people on the internet. I did a debate with Dave, I did an interview with Dave Rubin, and I said, you know, I love winding up atheists saying how wrong they are because the comment sections are amazing. And the first comment under the video was, how dare you say we're thin-skinned? Um, <laughs> 
Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic. I know God loves me, because although God hates fags, he hates feminists more. Um, <laughs> Um, so the atheism movement really doesn't interest me that much, but I did enjoy watching it torn apart by social justice warriors. Well, I'm not an atheist, I'm a secularist. Um, I despise all religion equally. Uh, but there are some that get away with doing very bad things because the left capitulates. Um, and you can you know, scream and shout about the Pope, which I do, and similarly with you know, other... Um, you know, Orthodox Christians. I mean, I went undercover to um, a conversion therapist to turn me straight. Didn't work. <laughs> and uh, I find that repellent, and I find Orthodox Judaism repellent. But unfortunately, many on the left will capitulate to radical Islam. So that, that's my feeling, my view on, on religion. And I do think that atheists actually have an awful lot of moral superiority, and I don't know where they get it from. <laughs> They're frightfully smug, and all they ever do is repeat the same three lines from that fucking Dawkins book. Let's take the next question. Okay, so both of you are gay, so I was wondering... Um, <laughs> it's a good start, sir. Carry on. Um, Did you want a demonstration? Uh, no, thank you, no, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, do, do you think um, feminism has influenced the gay movement, or um, get the gay movement influenced feminism in their excesses, both good and bad, or whatever? Yeah, only negatively. Sorry, let you, go, you go first, go first. Oh, somebody asked me the other day if I was a practicing lesbian, and I said, no, I'm absolutely perfect at it now. Been, <laughs> you know, You've been doing it for quite it, some yeah, time. It's been nearly 40 years. Um, <laughs> I actually, I'm so pleased you asked this question for one you reason. You must be great at the flute as well. You know, did you find that it improves your, your woodwind abilities? The reason why I'm very pleased that you asked this question is that you could read my book <laughs> on this very issue called Straight Expectations, um, which looks at the way that the gay movement has become pathetic, apolitical, um, materialistic, schmaltzy, and ultra-conservative, and that the only radical edge to it are the, the, the lesbian feminists. And incidentally, everybody in this room, all women, can be a lesbian. Yes, I'm glad you're all not. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have some sympathy with that view. I'm actually just going to take my time instead to do something else, which is to say um, there is, you know, there's a safe space across 15 minutes away from here for people who would be too traumatized to listen to this conversation. And I would just like to you know, send a message of sympathy to the social justice warriors on campus, because they're the ones missing out. Aren't we having a good time? <laughs> I mean, if, if, anybody, uh, if anybody can explain to me what, what compromises student safety about the conversation we're having, I would love to know. So give us a second while we move the line for the sake of the camera. We'll give as quick answers as we can to get through as many people as possible. We've got a little more than can be accommodated, but we're going to be super, super quick. We'll try and do as many as we can. All right. Uh, this is a question for Milo. And um, with your mentioning earlier and responses that, you know, we're pretty much chastising basing on the lack of factual evidence, you know, for some of the other viewpoints. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you came to follow an ideology that is based on no sense of evidence um, that historically has um, been detrimental and towards homosexuals, including the dangerous ones like you? Um, well, I, I just I fundamentally reject that Catholicism and homosexuality are, um, you know, these sort of two different universes. The church has protected gays longer than governments have. If you were gay in Ireland in the 1950s and you didn't want to be killed or socially ostracized, you joined the clergy. And that doesn't, mean, that well. doesn't mean you'd become a pedophile priest because, of course, feminists love to, you know, ro rope those two things in together. But um, newsflash, gays and pedos aren't the same thing. Um, what it does mean is that the Catholic Church protected people who had those proclivities from society for centuries in some cases, in some places. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and anyway, look, identity is messy and complex, and very often progressives will say, well, how can you be gay and religious? That's ridiculous. And how can you be so logical and religious? Look, 
People are messy and complicated, and life is messy and complicated. Progressives are perfectly happy to insist on their own uh, complex, inscrutable, bizarre way of describing themselves, cis, intersex, demi-queer, like, you know, whatever. But anybody they don't like um, is subjected to demands for total and complete consistency across Mother, the board. Mother, you said you'd keep the answers short. Yeah, all right. To remind you. I'm done. I'm still working it out. Who knows? Hey there. My question is, um, where does this third wave free speech hating uh, phenomenon come from? Is it a... This, this is for both of you, no, actually. No, not from her. I meant she should oh. ask the question. I didn't mean she did it. Uh, is, is it from the, the underlying assumptions of second wave feminism? Is it from an outside influence? Is it... Where does it come from? I, I think know. it's class-based. Um, it's an extremely privileged group of women yes, and their male allies. Yeah. And what's happened is it's that, that they've, they've done all this, oh, we can't defend men, and men are running the feminist societies, and it gives did an you know, opportunity. Did you, have you seen this? The, the, um, the NUS women's, women's officer, officer, the leading candidate for NUS women's officer is a straight man who cross-dresses yep. um, and uses a female bathroom but makes no, um, no secret of the fact that he sleeps with women. And this is the leading candidate for the NUS Women's Office. That's right. You're so, right about this class stuff, by the way. Yeah, I mean, it's totally privileged people who think that they should be protected from everything that puts them outside of their comfort zone. They have never, ever been uncomfortable or challenged in their lives. Millennial. And, uh, and actually, what, what then happens is their male allies can stand up and scream in my face, and this has happened, yeah. and to my other feminist colleagues' faces, you fucking transphobe, you fucking yeah. whorephobe and still be seen on the side yeah, it, of the social progressive. In many cases, it's an excuse for misogyny from the left towards existing is. women. Um, and millennial, I mean, you're, you're right. About, I think this analysis is absolutely correct. Also, millennials are the first entirely middle-class generation who just have never encountered any genuine trauma or suffering. They've never wanted for anything. Um, so, you know, I, of course, these tiny things get blown up into massive proportions. Yeah, anyway, I think we should move on, but thank you for the question. Uh, hey, Milo, uh, you know I love you, and I love you, Julie. You didn't have but, to cue, you know. Um, but I'm going to challenge you pretty bad here, because... Thank you, and uh, okay. You call yourself a libertarian. How do you justify being a libertarian and also being so tough on uh, border controls? I mean, these refugees that are coming in from Syria mm -hmm. to Europe, you, you're calling them rapists, basically. You're playing the Donald Trump card here, literally. Uh, What's wrong with how daddy? How can you justify that? Isn't that the same argument that people oh, give when they daddy. say, isn't that the same argument oh, that people give I when they say, oh, ban, ban guns because, you know, I mean, people kill, go, people go on shooting sprees with them. Well, let them. I mean, the refugees I, I, I also have question. just as much of a right. Question. They're also um, humans. I didn't say that all Syrians were rapists. I said what we were doing, which is absolutely true, is that we were importing a culture which is totally antithetical to our way of life. Many of these people are dedicated to the destruction of Western civilization in various forms, and we are importing Patri uh, a genuinely patriarchal society has no respect for the rights of women. That is absolutely what we are doing. I don't know if you can That's call yourself a libertarian and say that at the same time. Well, then I'm not one. Um, excuse then you're me. Not. Then I'm not one. Can, can, I, can I just say one very brief thing? Yes. Isn't it interesting how men who deny rape all of a sudden are feminist best friends on rape culture? Who's denying when it comes rape to here? Naming men, Who's denying rape Some here? men as being programmed to rape. Milo, you said Syrians still coming here, to rape. and I can't remember the exact words that you said, but you, but you, you said that they come in here and commit some rape spree, okay? Yeah. And isn't it funny how all of these right-wing commentators, not just you, others, have all of a sudden become great pro-feminists in the fight to end sexual violence towards women. I'm not a feminist. Not I can't stand like them. them. I just don't want women to be raped, and I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want it to be by people who shouldn't be here. I don't like feminism, but I don't want women to be raped either. All right, hello. I'm not as fabulous as either of you. I'm only bisexual, and um, oh, dude. make up I, your mind. I, it's really hard. But now, what's the just, point? Greedy. I don't know. Greedy. I don't know. But uh, I'm rather. It does I, mean you've got a chance with both of us because we both got very low standards. <laughs> That's why I'm a lesbian, remember? <laughs> Maybe I'll I thought you were a lesbian because you loved knitting and pleasure cruises. <laughs> <laughs> 
anyway, my question Sorry. is... Scrabble, um, that's the other one. <laughs> I'm not religious and rather left-wing. So the society says I should agree with Mrs. Bindle, but I more so agree Mrs. with Mrs. Oh, you really done it now. <laughs> You've really done it now. Mrs. Oh, my dear. Qu my question is, with this sort of <laughs> counterculture, um, what, do you think that uh, these sort of SJW movements will go away? in time, and what do you think will happen to this counterculture after that happens? The and more thank you the, for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, make up your mind, I mean it. Uh, the, <laughs> the more that the public finds out about social justice warriors, about the excesses of modern feminism, about the insane things that Black Lives Matter say, and by the way, the world they want isn't so far away from the world the KKK want, with racial division and black-only dorms and all this kind of stuff. Um, they, they, they don't have the same beliefs, but the world they're heading towards looks very similar. Um, the more the public find out about these crazy left-wing progressive movements, the more the public go nuts, and the more politicians, I think, are going to realize that it will not get them elected by pandering to these people. I think we have crested on the social... The way, social justice wave has crested. I think 2016 is the year the, pub, the public starts to find out about this feminist nonsense uh, and starts refusing to elect candidates who uh, sign up to it. Last question. Daddy! <laughs> Um, to follow the last comment, thank you both very much for coming. It's been a great discussion. However, I'm a little disappointed that we haven't really addressed what was advertised. Does feminism have a free speech problem? And though we can't really... Oh, I'm not pointing fingers here. My little bit. Yeah. Um, so I guess I would just ask, who do you guys respectively believe is the greatest threat to free speech? Do you believe it's bl uh, blaspheme laws? Do you believe it's just general leftism? Uh, what do you believe? Thank you. Well, I believe in fair speech. I don't believe in a, in a complete blanket free speech. And I think there are very few people who could justify a totally blanket free speech with absolutely no legislation mm -hmm. whatsoever when it's an actual incitement to actual violence mm -hmm. rather than me going on uh, onto a campus and somebody screaming, she'll kill trans women or whatever <laughs> is in their imagination. Um, I think that the threat to, to free speech um, is... Oh, many-fold. I mean, rich right-wingers buying up most of the newspapers, putting out monolithic messages. Um, it just depends. But feminism being blamed for it when, you know, these people are actually part of a ridiculous, pampered social justice movement that has some self-identified feminists that do not practice feminism in any way that I recognize at all. Um, it's very clear to me that the progressive left... Uh, the left that you will read on Gawker, on BuzzFeed, on Vox, on Mike, on all of these uh, new media websites, the progressive left that has a stranglehold on campus politics, the progressive left that many faculty are going along with, the progressive left that lies about and to men and has done for decades, that lies about race to stoke tensions, that lies about all sorts of things, um, that exists in a state of sort of, uh, well, I call it uh, quantum superstate feminism. It sort of exists simultaneously as aggressor and victim. Um, the sort of feminism that screams blue murder when it gets 1% of the hatred back that it pushes into the world. The sort of feminism that will scream and shout and say that we're being silenced. We're being silenced very loudly. Um, <laughs> The sort of feminism that wants men publicly ridiculed and shamed, the sorts of uh, race-based hatred that hates white people, kill all white men, um, and if you disagree with them, you are a bigot, those are silencing tactics. When somebody is scared for their professional or social lives, for having the wrong opinions or sharing the wrong facts, that's oppression. That is an example of free speech at risk. The progressive left, particularly as it exists on American campuses, but also as it exists, I'm sorry to say, throughout the American media, is very clearly the greatest threat to free speech in the West. I wanted to make... Is that the politically correct thing now, female people? That's the menstruation thing, isn't it? What, what is it that the crazies I don't, say? I don't do it no, good. You've, re you've reformed. You've reformed. What is it they say? They say, like, not all, not all women menstruate. All right, mate. Hi, this is a question from Miss Bindell. Uh, you said in your intro that you are a real feminist. Why do you say that? What, if someone identifies as a feminist just because they don't go by your standards or what you believe, they still count as a feminist, right? Well, like I say, there are many different types of feminism. Most of them are wrong. Um, <laughs> feminism has to be a movement which challenges an oppression 
and a power imbalance and seeking a liberation from that oppression. And it has to include all women. It can't just be about women at the top. It has to include all women. And if it's not, if it's all about individual rights and choice, and hey, you know, thanks for the, the rights that you fought for me, you second waivers, but you're so last season, we're going to pull down our way to liberation, as I said earlier. That's not feminism. Margaret Thatcher was not a feminist because she was a strong woman. You need more than a vagina and a loud voice to actually say you're a feminist. You have to subscribe to a set of principles. Now, I wonder why feminism is the only liberation movement that has to constantly justify itself for, well, having, uh, for, for having a set of aims and objectives like every other liberation movement has. I think it's clear. I mean, as, as anybody who has witnessed three girls fighting over one man uh, can attest, you know, women can't agree on anything. They can't agree on the methods to anything. They can't even run a fem female liberation movement. Look at the history of feminism. <laughs> I mean, look how many different definitions of feminism. You're entitled to define it how you want, but other people don't agree with you. Sorry, you don't get the, uh, you don't get the monopoly. And in fact, your version of feminism is this big now. Um, you know, most feminists are the batshit crazy progressives. You know, that's not what feminism means anymore. I'm sorry, like, I agree with you on loads of that stuff, but it's just not what feminism is anymore. Um, and the, his the, the fact that the history of feminism is so fraught uh, with counter, like, rows and backstabbing and bitching and, you know, all these internecine quarrels and renamings and, you no, no, this is feminism. Well, you have to look, what, what does feminism have that no other movements have? It's in entirely women. respect and you did not allow me to have a platform to to do that so I'm I think you I'm yeah. taking, I can't I can't I, I can't I think do you have a question I do okay. my question my question my question is if rape culture is a myth then explain why Kesha was not allowed to break the contract with her executive when he obviously raped her. Uh, I'm not I'm going to I'm comment on an individual case um, I, that I know nothing about. You're obviously better educated in pop culture than I am. I'll have to pass, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, let's just do one more. Let's give somebody else a spot. Thank, thank you for coming up, sir. I actually could. Oh no, not me. Sorry. So what? Do we saw another woman? A woman would be nice. Hi, Milo. Hey. Well, I didn't actually come here to come ask you a question. I have a, more of a statement, and I'm about to piss off needs, a lot of social needs, justice warriors. No, no, no. It needs to be brief. Shoehorn a question in at the end and okay. make your statement as brief as you can. I believe that free market, excuse me, I believe that debates such as this are exchanges of free market ideas. I believe that these are necessary for a civilized society to discuss, to discuss hard issues. That's why I believe as a transgender woman, it's important to have this discussion. I believe that, you know, you, both of you have some views that may run counter to my existence, but I believe that you have the right to express them. And frankly, I'm a little more than tired of social justice warriors misrepresenting myself and my community. I'm sorry that you have to go through some of those things you have to go through. That's not what we're like at all. Thank and you very much for that. Um, I know, and, and I know, and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, that, thank you. I do. I'm, so, I'm so sorry that your community has been maligned and represented in the way that a small group of very vicious, misogynistic trans people have, all trans women in fact, no trans men, ha have sought to represent you. And I get emails constantly from trans people saying the same. I can now quite safely say I have many more trans women friends 
than I do that exists in the small, nasty cabal that sit behind their keyboards, constantly spewing out vicious hate. And I so appreciate meeting you, and I really hope that we get the chance to say hello properly after this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have a question. My question, go ahead, go ahead. Um, as an LGBT person, it seems intersectionality seems to be caught in this trap between defending LGBT people and defen defending women and defending um, this patriarchal uh, um, refugee culture. And I want to know what your opinions are. Like, what do you think is going to be the future? Will we see more intersectional feminists defending this patriarchal culture, or will they actually stand up for LGBT rights and for women? Um, I'll be quick. Uh, intersectionality is meaningless. It's just a, a new way to describe a very old idea, which um, Julia, we discussed this briefly in the green this is Julie's point, not mine's. But, um, but you know, it's just a way to describe the fact that some people have shit lies for more than one reason. Um, and <laughs> um, as far as where they're going on the patriarchy thing, I see the progressive left as fully all in on the pro-Islam project. Um, they are determined to make Muslims the top of the oppression league tables. They are determined to make Syrian refugees, whether or not, as the intelligence services tell us, that large proportions of them um, come in with cultures that are just totally alien to ours, who don't respect our women, don't respect our gay or our trans people. Two trans people uh, were uh, assaulted in a German park, um, I think, three weeks ago. When, when I see the progressive left, and particularly feminists, defending the behavior of this culture, and it is a cultural issue, and victim blaming the young German girls who were assaulted, it's very clear to me that this is a bizarre cult that no longer sticks up for women at all, and is in fact, in some cases, where it thinks there are pro progressive plaudits to be had in the media, will turn on women, like it does on Julie. And I stand in solidarity with my sisters who were born into Muslim cultures who are resisting the Islamofascists uh, Islam and who are asking lefty, liberal, white people to stop defending the male patriarchal Islamofascists. If we there's have a message, no right, we have no right to defend it. If there are any um, angry, sorry, that should you should applaud that. Um, If there are any um, angry blue-haired women with facial piercings watching the live stream, or even in the audience, um, hi, darling, uh, I have one thing to say to you, which is shut up about microaggressions, shut up about mansplaining, shut up about manslamming, shut up about manspreading, and cast your eyes over to the Middle East and do some good. Thank you again, thanks. Okay, you have just distinguished yourself wonderfully as an audience. Agreed. And our guests have distinguished themselves wonderfully as debaters. I would like to invite your closing statements if you wish to make them. Uh, Julie, do you have anything you wanna say? That there are many, many feminists, contrary to Milo's assertions, that are real feminists, serious feminists, feminists working very hard to overthrow this horrendous culture of sexual violence and men's entitlement. There are many men who are the allies of feminists who really believe that we should overthrow this hideous culture. And I think the identifarians, the special snowflakes, those that support the oppressors rather than women's struggle, will go out of fashion. Um, I don't think it'll happen tomorrow, but I constantly hear of young women who say, I've just heard of radical feminism. I didn't hear it in my feminist society at university, but I heard it elsewhere. So the more that you can open your minds up and the minds of your colleagues and friends to debate so that feminists can come and speak on campus without being screamed at for being some kind of fascist, Please do. Um, if there's any ladies in the audience, thanks for coming. But um, <laughs> I'm going to address this to the men. Um, we live in a, quite aside from anything even remotely resembling a patriarchy, 
um, and I've since explained some of the reasons I think uh, that that concept is preposterous this evening, or at least is simply out of date, probably 30 years out of date. Quite distinct from such a, you know, such a concept, men live in a very hostile climate. Men live in um, a world where they do not have free speech, where it is socially disadvantageous and professionally dangerous to discuss things like the campus rape culture myth or the wage gap, or indeed even more simple issues of how men and women are different. These sorts of things can make you lose your job and can take away your platform if you are a journalist or a researcher or an academic. Now that is real silencing. But um, men should take comfort from at least from the fact that it was male ingenuity that explored the oceans that told us about our planet. It's male imaginativeness that got us to the stars. It is men who have built most of what is best about the world. There are some instances in which... Are you all right? Do you need a lozenge? <laughs> there are some instances, and the further back you go in history, many instances in which um, women have been treated very unjustly Living in America today is not one of those periods in history. Living in America today, men are routinely ridiculed, bullied, derided in the media. There are structural disadvantages to being a man today. It's my contention that the pendulum, pendulum has swung a little bit too far the other way, and that there are corrections necessary, and that one of the ways in which men uh, don't have a great time is that their free speech is severely curtailed by a brand of feminism that seems to have a stranglehold on, the acad on academia, on the media, and on politics. The last thing I'll say is there's not too much to worry about because ultimately this poisonous, hateful, bigoted, sexist system is starting to be appreciated, and I mean that in the sense of come, it's being uh, exposed to the public, and the public doesn't like it very much. They're not going to vote for candidates who sign up to this nonsense. They're not going to read books by people who spread it. This tiny, shrill, angry, broken, you know, full of damaged people, awful, some of the worst people in the world, who insist on controlling how the rest of us live, policing our sexuality, policing our re sexual relationships with others, they are a tiny, angry minority, and they are shrinking by the day. And although, yes, the feminist contingent of them represents the greatest threat to free speech in American society today. That is coming to an end. At least it is getting better. So stay the course, have faith, and let's beat feminism together. <laughs>